Morning. Morning. Good morning. Morning. Well, hopefully Justin will show up. He signed up as if no one else signs up, I'll do it, which of course, once you sign up, of course, no one else is going to sign up. So nope. that's true. <laughs> this would be a cruel joke. There he is. <laughs> All right. Was there was there some banter happening before I got in and it just stopped? <laughs> well, it was. I wonder if Justin's going to show up. Banter, basically. So I see you have shorn yourself. I have shorn myself like a sheep. <laughs> yeah, I watched yeah. the uh, uh, supervised machine learning for text analysis with our video and saw you shorn. I was like, oh, it's it's a new Justin. <laughs> Yeah, I hadn't thought about that, but I don't think uh, anyone remarked on it there, which is <laughs> fine. Uh, but that didn't take long here. <laughs> um, I guess. Uh, so we should we should we start? Uh, yeah, I think everyone else has uh, spread out to other cohorts. So let's go f go to it. Okay. All right. I, got, I hope you all are ready to see some. <laughs> uh adobe borders because those it turns out those are inevitable <laughs> um okay so yes so i'll get started so today my goal is to cover the rest of the chapter excluding the lab and uh, at the end we can talk about if we want to do the lab next week or move on to support vector machinations as i prefer to call them um all right so the very so okay well the transition is we're going from single decision trees to forests of various sort although only one of these models actually has forest in the name so the very simple the simplest extension of of decision trees of single decision trees to ensemble methods which is the the general genre of, of what's going to happen here although ensemble methods uh you know, those aren't just for, for trees. Anyway, the simplest uh, ensemble method is bagging. So it's an ensemble method uh, in its general. So that's what I just said. I obviously know my slides very well, uh, but what is it? What is bagging? So it's kind of a acronym-ish like word. Um, the B is from bootstrap and the agging 
is uh, from aggregationing, I suppose. Um, so Bootstrap, uh, as most people probably encountered it for the first time in their lives, uh, was for getting standard errors on models where you didn't want to make assumptions about the, the distribution. Um, but it turns out you can do it for, you can use uh, the bootstrap for stranger purposes. And um, so I'm just going to say, so here, and so I'll get to what the purpose is in the next slide. But um, before moving on to the, the purpose, the wherefore, the why, it's probably good to say just what's going to happen. Um, so again, from the book, always very succinct. Uh, so what bagging is for regression trees is just creating B trees so that that capital B we're going to see quite a bit. Uh, so that's going to be a the hyperparameter for how many trees we ultimately create. Uh, so we're going to create B of those. And how are we going to create B? Well, we're just going to fit trees on B bootstrap training sets and then average the resulting predictions. And this is a key point, uh, the one I'm about to highlight, that the trees are grown deep and not pruned. Um, I've seen people say the opposite, but I trust this book a bit more. Um, uh, I think that people who say the opposite are confusing this, this with um, boosting, which we'll get to in a second. And uh, anyway, so each individual tree is going to have high variance. And in case, uh, and that's just a throwback to last week, why will I have high variance? Because they're grown deep. So they're probably going to be fitting to some amount of noise, um, but they're going to have low bias. Okay, so uh, so what was the purpose? What is the purpose of, of this use of the bootstrap? It is to reduce variance. And in parentheses, trees suffer from high variance. That's why we'd want to do that. And I have technical intuition up there on the top of the slide because I'm going to put in some, some variables. Uh, so I'll try to do this pretty quickly. Um, you may remember from back in stats days that if you have some, some variables that are uh, IID distributed uh, identically and independently, identical and independent. Uh, and you, so we're just going to give them the variance of uh, variance sub Z. Um, and you have a bunch of them. Um, that's what that function will be. So it's, it's linear. But then um, if you average those, you reduce uh, the variance by, by one over N. So if you can get a bunch of independent uh, draws and you can average that, you're going to reduce the variance of, of your estimator. Now, this, again, this is an old stats point, um, well, uh, is assumes that what you're, you're drawing is independent. So each, it, each draw is independent, which is not true in bagging. So this is a very like heuristic understanding of the big picture of what we're trying to do. Um, but when we get to random forests, we'll see how they start to approximate, how we start to approximate, you know, what the intuition behind this formula a little more. Um, okay. So, so that was just a little preview of, I guess, what we'll see. Um, and, and here, this is just a kind of lonely slide with a one formula, but um, I think it's, it, I think it's good to see like what, how an ensemble method works, how an ensemble estimator works uh, in, in this kind of technical way. So, you know, as always, we're trying to, you know, provide a, a function for independent variables uh, to get at the, at the predicted, at the outcome variable. And so what, what all of these ensemble methods are going to do in some form or another is sum over a bunch of, you know, sort of uh, constituent. Um, by the way, let me know if, if something happens with my screen. I just got a notification saying participants can now see your application, which sort of implies that you couldn't before. I, we could, um, so that's so just weird. Pipe up if uh, <laughs> things go dark, please. Um, okay, so, so you'll notice what's going on here is that um, this B, as I said, remember, is a, a, a it's capital B is something we'll see often. Um, here it's the number of both trees and 
bootstrap samples because each tree corresponds to a bootstrap sample. And you're just using each of these sort of subtrees, uh, its prediction, and then averaging them. And so one thing you'll notice is that this is for a regression, it's for a quantitative variable because we're uh, taking the mean of it. But if we wanted to do a classification, we would just do majority vote in this case. Um, and so it's a very simple idea, but it's a pretty cool idea. Um, and it's going to be the basis for things that we see. But uh, there's one little kind of side topic that we can that I can address before we go on to, to more advanced models. Um, and so um, one acronym that um, you probably saw in this chapter is OOB. Uh, so it's actually not outside, it's just out of bag. Um, but uh, so 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 where does this where does OOB come from? What is what are out of bag observations? So if we think about it practically, uh, just to set the scene for what we want to do, um, notice here that we're already fitting B models. So we're fitting B trees, and if we want to do cross validation, we would have to fit B trees on K folds, and so. If we wanted to save time and be very efficient, we could have sort of a, a free lunch. And we would do that by remembering that not, our, not every observation was used to fit every tree. In fact, because of the bootstrap sample. In fact, there's a, a nice exercise earlier in the book, um, not as in earlier than this chapter, where you, you demonstrate to yourself that in expectation, um, you're gonna use two thirds of observations for every tree B. So you're only going to use two thirds of the sample, which of course means that there's one third, and those are the titular uh, out of bag observations. And so the idea, uh, the idea of this, this free lunch is to use those out of bag observations as validation sets, because you didn't use them to fit the model. So you're going to be able to use them to estimate test error. And so if we just imagine this real quick, um, so let's just take a nice number that's divisible by three. So we're going to set B equals 99. So just to take one random observation, it's not random actually. There was this Sunday was the 56 Super Bowl. So I decided, okay, so we'll take row 56. Uh, we expect that to have been used to fit 66 of those 99 models. So in expectation, there are 33 out of bag sets where we can out of bag trees that we can use to estimate the test error for uh, observation 56. So the out of bag error for 56 would look something like this, um, assuming that again, it's a regression problem and that um, we're using the squared error. It would just be the actual observed value for observation 56 minus the average prediction minus the average out of bag prediction squared. And then we would get that for all of the observations and we could take the, uh, mean of that to get the mean squared error, the estimate of the mean squared error for the test set. Um, so that's how that would work. It's a pretty pretty cool idea. It's a pretty efficient idea. They, and you can use any old metric for OOB error, of course. Um, it generalizes beyond regression. Um, and they have, uh, and I, for some reason, I feel like it was Trevor Hasty who wrote uh, this interesting comment that the, uh, the estimate is essentially the leave one out cross validation error for bagging if B is large. Again, B number of trees. And, and that, that's all he says, but I assume that he means when B divided by three is equal to N minus one. I assume that's what he means, but maybe not. Again, N minus, so if you're doing leave one out cross validation, you have uh, N minus one estimates of the test error for your observation, for each observation. And then when B equals three, again, that's the in expectation, how many, um, how many estimates, how many models, you, the particular estimate was not in. So I don't know if anyone has any thoughts about that. I'm interested to know, but that's, that's as far as I got with that thought. We're gonna move on now. Well, first we're not gonna move on. Before we move on, um, here's a graph from the, uh, from the book. And so <clears throat> as a reference point, this dashed line is the comparison, is, is our comparison to what we were doing last week. 
It's a test error from a single classification tree, so a single decision tree. And so two of these lines are things that we haven't discussed yet. We have random forests, so we're going to kind of ignore this goldenish line and the and the blue line and just focused on focus on the black line and the green line. So one thing, there are a couple of things to notice. Um, maybe three things to notice. The first is that this green line is quite a bit lower um, than the black line. That goes unmentioned in the book. I haven't spent a lot of time thinking about why uh, out of bag estimations of test error would underestimate test error. I, and one of the reasons I haven't thought a lot about it other than laziness is because I'm not sure if that's an artifact of this particular application that they have. So, um, so again, this is another thing where if anyone has any thoughts, I'm very happy to hear it. One argument, well, not argument against it, but one thing is that you'll notice that for the random forest, which again, we haven't covered, uh, the same thing happens um, where this blue line is quite a bit, is significantly different from this, um, from this golden line. So there's that, that's one thing to notice. So uh, the, uh, the test, like um, it says, says test not. Uh, I can't hear you. Bag. Can um, you I can hear him. Oh, I can't hear anybody. Yeah. All right. So this is a me problem. Let me change. I wonder where the audio is coming from. I, can you hear right. us now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I okay. I, I was just saying. So the the test lines, that's just like a single test set, right? It's just yes. like a, so, so there's a lot of luck involved, I suppose, in that and how your test set happens to be drawn, which might be the difference between the green line and the black line then. And if you'd happen to draw a different test set, it might be reversed even, I suppose. So something I'm thinking about is the validation set versus the test set. Sometimes there was a difference between those where the test set was almost more of a theoretical concept. Um, in the, I'm trying to go back to chapter five, like with simulated data versus validation set was like that simple um, way to validate. Do you, does anybody have an idea of whether we're talking about validation set or like a theoretical, you know, test set based on what we, if we knew the data generating process, you know? My intuition from this is that they're talking about um, an, an actual uh, test set, but I could, and I, and I think that's probably indicated by the fact that this line moves around a bit at the beginning. Um, so that's my, that's my thought there. Um, so, but, so that actually brings me to my, this, 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 this discussion brings me to my second point is notice that the, uh, out of bag estimate is quite a bit wigglier than uh, these two lines uh, that correspond to the test error, which flat line. And, and I'm guessing that's because you know each um, because there is more because the the set is changing um, even as the number of trees grow. Anyway, so that's one thing. And then the last thing to notice, uh, the last thing that I noticed anyway, uh, is that overfitting doesn't really happen. Um, so you fit more and more trees and the line just stays flat. So remember that um, you would expect when overfitting happens, as you increase some complexity parameter, that one that's positively associated with complexity, uh, you expect test error or even estimate of test error to go up. And um, that doesn't happen here. So that's one point that they, they do make in the book. All right, so I'll move on. I think we're done with bagging. Oh, no, real quick. Um, I hope it's quick. OK, so the thing about this, so um, one of the benefits of decision trees is that they're very easy to visualize, both in partitioning of, of sample space, or sorry, a feature space, and um, in the, I mean, the, the decision trees that, that we look at. Um, and that's not going to happen with bagging. I mean, if you have, to go back to the previous slide, you know, if you fit a, a bagged tree model with 200 trees, I mean, there's no one tree you can look at anymore. Um, so we have to find some other way to, to figure out what's going on in this model if we don't want it to be just a complete black box. 
Um, so there's this, this measure called variable importance. And um, for regression and regression applications, it, quant it, it measures the, the residual sum of squares, the drop in residual sum of squares associated with splits due to a given predictor. Uh, and then in classification, it's total drop in Gini due to splits using a given predictor. Um, and I'll show you a common visualization of that in the next slide. Um, but one thing to notice is that it's going to be unsigned in the sense of, you know, if you look at output for a regression model, you have signed parameters that are positive or negative. So you can say things like this variable is positively associated with the outcome. This variable is negatively associated with this outcome. Um, and that's not going to happen for very importance. And that's something that you might want. Um, interestingly, I, I was looking at the documentation and you can get variable importance, signed variable importance for both linear models and generalized linear models. Um, although I've never seen anyone use variable importance for those models. Um, but anyway, this is what it would look like. Um, so notice how everything is to one side of the uh, y-axis because again, it's, it's unsigned. So you just have this magnitude. Um, and this was in a um, health data set. And so I think this is that thallium was the most important predictor. Uh, and it's usually normalized to where 100, you give a square of 100 to the most important predictor. Um, and this was, I believe, a classification example. So, um, so this would be drops in, in uh, the Gini impurity index. Okay, so that's what that looks like. And just as a very brief note, um, this is not covered in the book, but um, Julia Silge mentions it quite a bit in a lot of the tidy models presentations she does. There are these SHAP values, which interestingly, I mean, <laughs> this is a funny thing. So SHAP is already the first four letters of this, but also it's Shapley additive explanation. That's where this, this comes from. And I'm not going to go into them, um, but you do get these, these plots, which I'm not, you know, I mean, don't try to try to read this. Um, but this was from one of her screencasts. And the idea is that you actually get these, you get sort of measures of whether or not uh, the presence are, I mean, these are a lot of dummy variables. So the presence or absence of that variable um, positively impacts the outcome. So if you're not satisfied with the unsignedness of uh, variable importance measures, you can use SHAP values, um, which I will not cover. Okay, so that was bagging. Um, the simplest one, and uh, here, here are random forests, which piggyback nicely on it. So as in bagging, uh, the trees are going to be built. So we, uh, we're, still, we're still dealing with trees, still dealing with trees. Um, so we're going to use bootstrap samples. But the key difference is that when we make these splits, instead of considering all of our P predictors, we're only going to consider a random subset. Now, I've tried to italicize this to make some important distinctions. You might think that uh, we have B trees. So at the beginning of fitting, you know, tree 56, um, at that point, we're going to consider just M predictors. And so that tree will have only M predictors, but that's not, that's not what it is. It's that at each split, we're going to consider a random subset of M predictors. So each tree in total, maybe can consider all P predictors. Um, it's kind of a roll of the dice. Um, but at each split, there are only going to be M of the P predictors, where M is, is less than P. <clears throat> and so, so M then is no new hyperparameter. So we have B and M now. And um, typically, if you fit a model, M will be, at least in uh, regression, M will be the square root of P. So for example, when they did this for their heart data set, um, they, they had four out of 13, which you can calculate is uh, about, you know, I mean, obviously four squared is uh, 16. So, um, so I'm not sure, I mean, this is very technical. I'm not sure if it just rounds up or if it rounds the nearest number, but anyway. Um, okay, so um, what's, the, what's the purpose of this? Um, if you watch their lecture videos, um, Rob makes a big point of how unintuitive this is. So it seems like a terrible idea, right? I mean, imagine that you have a, a great predictor, what good could it possibly do to, to leave it out of, of as leave it out as a candidate for a given split? The idea is that it's going to decorrelate trees. Um, and this will reduce variance 
of the trees when they're averaged. And you may remember that that's the entire purpose of, of bagging is to reduce the variance of the estimator. And um, let's see, I'm gonna go back up to here. So this decorrelation of trees um, is also, you may remember from before when I was saying that, you know, the kind of the idea of this is that if we had a lot of independent estimates of our outcome, um, we could reduce the variance by, by, by averaging over them. And, um, <clears throat> and the, I put out this formula that is just kind of this classic formula for getting the, the variance of an estimator of a proportion. And, um, but it depended on the trees being uncorrelated or depended on the variables being independent. And so this, this decorrelation of trees is gonna help us approximate that more. So that's kind of, the, again, the slightly more technical, it's a very hand wavy technical intuition. Um, and so in the book, there's this really nice quote, you know, suppose there's this uh, one very strong predictor. And even if you have um, bootstrap samples, it's probably going to be the initial split in every tree. So that's the idea of like, what's going to correlate, like, why are these trees going to have correlated output um, is because they're going to have like the same initial split every time, for example. Um, and so, so for each one, you're going to consider um, some proportion. So you know, P minus M. So that would be, assume you have hundred features, you're gonna consider 10 of them if you're doing the, the square root, right? So you have 90 here, so 0. 0.9. So you're considering 0. 0.9 features. It would be like a, a common thing. Oh, sorry, yeah. Now you're considering 10, one, one tenth of the features. Um, and then one thing that uh, I haven't spent a lot of time thinking about, but is, you know, so this is, M is typically set at the square root of P. Um, but surely there are, are, are reasons why you might want it to be higher or lower. And really the only thing they mentioned in the book, um, other than just doing cross-validation to find it, is using a small value of M and building a random forest will typically be helpful when we have a large number of correlated predictors. So that, that's all I've got for, for a theoretical reason why M should be higher or lower. Okay, so now performance. Um, so we have a test classification error. Um, I, I'm going to assume this is on their cancer data set, possibly, probably. Um, so where there, there's, it's a 15 class, a huge uh, classification task. Um, in any case, um, although maybe not because these, these are pretty low for error. Anyway, um, so we have M equals P and then you'll, Maybe notice that M equals P is just bagging. And so there it is, chugging along. And you know, well, first of all, you might notice that these are not that different. Um, so we have M, so we where we consider half of the predictors at each split is the blue line, and it performs uh, indistinguishably, I would say probably statistically indistinguishably from <clears throat> considering every predictor. But then if we consider a significantly less subset, so the square root of P, and I think this is a pretty big uh, data set. Um, so it's gonna be a pretty small number. So M is gonna be a pretty small number relative to P. Um, there's a difference. So, I mean, you probably won't look at this and think, wow, random forests really outperform um, bagging, but you'll notice that you, given the strange um, behavior of, of just discarding the majority of your predictors, uh, you don't perform worse, which I think at first blush would be what most people think. Um, so that's quite a quite a curious thing. And um, and I just wanted to show this again. This is a graph that we've already seen, but at the time we hadn't talked about random forests. And you notice that in this one, um, for both the actual test estimate, um, well, the test set error rate, and yeah, and the out of bag uh, random forest is lower, although probably not statistically here. Although well, maybe so because it is very consistently lower. In any case, so that's the random forest. So random forests, uh, again, to conclude, for random forests are just like bagging, except that not only do we take a random subset of observations, um, we take a random subset of predictors. Okay, so now we're moving on to something that's pretty different. I just wanted to uh, interject one thing, quick thing before we move on that, I don't know, it's trivia that blows my mind that random forest is actually a trademark term. But, oh. but there isn't a generic term. Everyone's like, yeah, okay, fine. Uh, 
we're not going to come up with tissue for your Kleenex. We're just going to call it Kleenex. Um, but yeah, the people who developed it trademarked it, but didn't protect their trademark very well. So everyone just calls it Random Forest. Wow, I have no idea about that. <laughs> wow. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like, I guess, bagged um, random uh, subset boundaries or something like that is kind of the technique, but no one uses that. So random, random forest. <laughs> hmm. OK. Wow. All right. No, I'm, <laughs> I appreciate that trivia. I I now know something. Um, whereas before I did not. All right. So um, so we went from bagging and random forest trademark to now boosting. Okay. So really, the the main the points of continuity are that it is a general ensemble method. Um, and notice I say like bagging. So random forests are not a general ensemble method. By general, I mean applicable applicable to um, different estimators, like you could, you could, uh, you could bag uh, just linear models, right? Um, because you're just taking bootstrap samples and fitting the fitting the model. In a forest, you actually need a forest because, right? The key part of that algorithm and what makes it unique is only considering a certain subset of predictors at a split point, which is you know tree type model recursive partitioning uh, fitting behavior. Anyway, um, so okay, so now we're back to another general ensemble method. Um, and we're going to use it on trees. Um, but uh, we're going to introduce something called the weak learner. Um, so I just, again, before we were fitting um, trees that could be as complex as we wanted. Uh, here, we're not. That's going to be a key aspect of, of boosting. And it's going to be a fundamentally new way to cooperate, is what I put. But it, so for the, for the sub models to, to interact, uh, so before it was a very um, wisdom of the crowd type of thing where we had hopefully as independent as possible things kind of contributing by things. I mean, the models contributing to the overall output. Uh, so we're not getting well, no more independence uh, is what we're getting rid of. Now we're having these sequential models and they're compensatory is how I would put it. And that's going to become, I'll try to come back to that phrase, um, but that's, that's what's going to happen. All right, so um, well, let's just say so. So then notice that this is going to have this sequential element. So we're going to imagine that we have a current model. Uh, we're going to fit a decision tree to the residuals of that model. Okay. So and this is just a restatement. We fit a tree using the current residuals rather than the outcome y as a response. So we're taking a current model. So this is going to be the sequential part. Is that these models are going to come one after another. And they're compensatory in that we're fitting a decision tree to their residuals. Um, so the way that it's often phrased is that the, the next, the subsequent tree is going to be picking up the signal that was not captured by the previous tree. Although that eventually will not become true when we're just picking up noise, which is something I'll come back to in a second. Um, so you may wonder how this process gets off the ground. Um, because here it specifically says um, we're not using the outcome y. Um, so we're going to initialize our first tree, our zero width tree, as having a zero output, and then, which makes the residuals just equal to the y. So that's how that, that trick gets done. Um, <clears throat> let's see. And then some key things that we're going to see in the, in the algorithm for boosting. Uh, D is now going to be tree depth. So I mentioned earlier that this is going to be the introduction of the weak learner. So we'll see. Uh, D is going to equal one or two uh, quite often. Um, there's going to be a shrinkage parameter, which is sometimes called the learn learning rate, um, I think typically given by Lambda. Um, and then B, number of trees, and that's going to be more important now. So anyway, so this is the collection of, of hyperparameters. And why do I say more important? So well, why, why was it less important previously? As you remember, the uh, before it was really just a matter of having enough trees that we reach a stable estimate of the, the test error, or sorry, yeah, that we reach a stable um, level of accuracy. Um, and now that's not gonna be the case and we'll see that. Okay, so with that, um, I'll try to go through this pretty quickly because it's technical and this is gonna be something that you, would, if you really wanna understand, you just, there's no other way to do it than just like stare at it for a while and try to work out some implications. Okay, so this, I talked about this initializing step earlier. 
Um, and notice that this is going to be an iterative process. So we're going to have uh, for trees, you know, one through B, however many trees you decide to fit. Um, you're going to fit that beef tree with D splits, um, which means D plus one terminal nodes. Um, I, I shouldn't have put that. There's no reason to complicate this. So D splits and one split would be one split, and then you have two terminal nodes, for example. Um, that's called a stump, which is going to appear on the on next slide. Um, <clears throat> uh, but D is not going to change over the course of this. So, so we're going to fit the. So really, ideally, if I were pedagogically astute, I would have just left this whole clause out because the, the point of the algorithm is that we're going to fit the beef tree to the, the training set, training data, um, and then we're going to update the the big function. So notice that F doesn't have a uh, superscript here. And this is going to this is superscripts and subscripts are going to get real crazy when we get to the next algorithm. Um, so we update the big model by adding a shrunken version of the most recent tree. So, um, so here we have this this updating arrow, um, and so we have what our function was, and we're adding this shrunken version. So as you might remember from the previous slide, this lambda um, was a shrinkage parameter or the learning rate, right? And so you can think the smaller lambda is, the less contribution, the smaller the contribution of each individual boosted tree. Um, and so when we do that, we simultaneously um, update the residuals. So we remove, so we get these partial residuals. We remove that tree's um, contribution, I suppose, to the prediction, and then we have our, our new residuals. And that's it. We just do that B times, capital B times. Um, and then in the end, we're going to sum over those and uh, get our get our output. So one thing that um, that, uh, that when I when I stare at this, um, and we'll see that when we do the, the next algorithm, the BART, um, there's a burn in period. And um, so, which means that we don't use some initial amount of, of trees. So we might not use the first hundred trees or so. And sometimes I wonder about, uh, about that for this. Like, I, I wonder if I would have known to initialize. So it, it does make sense to get the algorithm up and running why you would initialize that the model predicts zero for all uh, observations. But if someone had said, why not? You know, if, some, if I were teaching this in a class where people could, uh, unmute themselves and ask me like, why not, uh, why not just the, the mean value of why? I don't know if I would be able to give a really uh, convincing answer for why not start there. Um, or correspondingly sort of why, if we're starting with this obviously very bad prediction, why are we not having any type of burn in? So that's something that I don't know. So I see Jonathan has unmuted himself. So I'm ready The, the way I look at this is, so conceptually, you're always fitting to residual. That's, yeah. And first of all, the residual is just the why, right? And that's, I don't know, maybe, I don't think it makes a, it's not a compelling argument, but <laughs> for me, it's like, it feels cleaner. I don't know. I, yeah, I mean, no, but the mean, the mean sounds perfectly reasonable too. I guess, no, I, I mean, it feels cleaner than a zero, really. So that, that I think that's a good question. Why not? Yeah, well, I'm glad it, it is. Is it obvious to anyone who's like just shaking their head and disgust? Like, why doesn't he? Know? <laughs> why doesn't he know that it's obviously got to be? F of here's, here's another way of looking at it. By setting the first one to zero, it's like a null model. It's like the first thing we fit is the is the data. If you set the mean, like you're already saying, I'm fitting, like my first model is the mean. That's true. Okay. So what you're doing is you're saying, it, it's kind of a, I feel like the calling it, it's a zero is a trick. Yeah. It's just saying we have no model. Because really you're fitting to Y like exactly. you would in any other model, but you're right. pretending that Y is a res yeah, residual. Right. Okay. That kind of makes sense. <laughs> yeah, that, that's the way I have to see it as a, as a trick to get the algorithm up and running. Yep. And actually, that's yep. something I just noticed, I think, for the first time, or perhaps I noticed and forgot earlier, is um, that I'll have to go up. So 
the, the initial tree is denoted as f sub zero. Um, and down here, I notice that the iteration starts at b equals one. So uh, anyway, so I noticed that just now. All right. Um, so that's the general idea of boosting. So again, it's sequential and compensatory um, because we're doing all so sequential because we're doing this updating and compensatory because we're fitting to partial residuals. Um, so hyperparameters, before I get on, so we're gonna go from hyperparameters to performance. So hyperparameters, we've got D is tree depth, as mentioned before. Uh, it's actually, it's both called and does determine, in fact, interaction depth. Um, so this was an interesting thing that um, remember trees, one of their, their benefits is that they, um, without, without even trying really, they include interactions between variables. Um, but if you don't have, if you have a tree depth of one, which means one split, um, there are no interactions. So um, having a tree depth of one, interestingly, gets you no interactions. Um, so I have confusingly, uh, this is terminologically, uh, it's confusingly no interactions is an interaction depth of one. So that's kind of a confusing terminology stumbling block. Um, and again, so if you set if you set if you create a boosted model with d equals one, you have an ensemble of stumps, which I kind of like as like a band name. Um, it's not as good as support vector machinations though, which was I thought great. Um, all right, so then you have um, lambda again, the shrinkage parameter of the learning rate, um, and then you write typical values. Um, would be a hundredth or a thousandth. So, I mean, that's that's pretty small. I mean, that's yeah, that's gotta be demoralizing for a tree, you know, it just tries to fit the data and then you say, all right, I want one thousandth of what, one thousandth of what you're giving me. I wouldn't like to be that kind of decision tree, you know? Um, and so, um, so it's gonna be, this is a, <laughs> an incredibly obtuse way of putting that. If you shrink, uh, if you have an incredibly low shrinkage parameter, so if you're shrinking a lot, uh, you're gonna need a lot of trees. Is what that would be. So, um, so I, I, I guess negatively correlated. The, the way I would justify having written that is, um, is to say like if you, if you're going to create a tuning grid, right? And you might just want to think about that for for efficiency of exploring hyperparameter space. Um, and let's see. So B um, again being the number of trees, and I note that that's more important now. Um, and it's because too big a B can now actually lead to overfitting. So now we're really going to have to subject um, B as a hyperparameter to cross-validation. Um, and unfortunately, this graph isn't going to bring it out. It's going to be a little bit in, I think, in probably the very last graph of this entire slide where we'll see this. Um, OK, so here we're comparing the um, you know, test classification error of three models, a two boosted models, um, one with depth one. So that's the additive model, uh, and one with the depth of two. And then with a, a random forest, which previously this, this had been our best model. Um, so you can think of it as kind of a, a criterion. So again, I guess we'll start with random forest. Uh, it's chugging along here at, you know, probably 0.135 or something around there, 0.14, I don't know. Uh, and you'll notice that here um, we have our boosted model, this kind of thicker blue line. And then we have a, uh, another boosted model, but now it's the stump model. Uh, down here. So again, you might think this is pretty wild. We have um, a bunch of stumps that are doing pretty well. Uh, I forget in the book if they mention if these differences are statistically significant, inversely correlated. Thanks, Jonathan. I saw a comment in the chat. Um, <clears throat> um, so yeah, so, so here you go. So you see that it's not only competitive, but probably better than a random forest model. Um, oh, and this, these are also not mentioned in the book, um, but if you have any, if you go into applications, you'll see things like add a boost, uh, or you see gradient boosting is mentioned quite a bit. Um, and at least in tidy models, there's, I think the default model for boosted trees is uh, XG boost, which is for, that X is for extreme gradient boosting. Um, and that's all I have to, I mean, so uh, if we end up doing labs, there'll probably be much more said about this, but uh, if we don't, then that'll be something you have to look at on your own. Okay, so for the last uh, ensemble method for trees, we're gonna talk about Bayesian additive regression trees. Uh, yeah. 
All right, and it's good. I'm out of coffee now. So, um, <clears throat> okay, so again, I'm just gonna quote them. So, okay, so what, what's the commonality with what we've had before is that there's an amount of randomness as in bagging and random forests. Uh, remember, randomness was a key idea in both of those. Um, but then it's gonna sort of conceptually at least, uh, or perhaps at most conceptually, um, try to capture signal not yet accounted for by the current model as in boosting. So we have the conceptual ideas uh, to understand BART. Um, and then the, the main novelty they write is the way in which the trees are generated. Um, and so I guess just to linger on that last point uh, and all the previous models, the way in which the tree is generated is um, the same way. Again, so that, that is a sort of vague way of saying how the splits are generated and the splits are generated by minimizing something like residual sum of squares. Um, and in a very mechanical way, just according to a loss function. So it's gonna, that's the part that's gonna get sort of shaken up with, uh, with BART. Okay, um, in BART, I have to say the notation and the, like the nesting of loops uh, gets <clears throat> to be really pretty crazy. Uh, one thing that they do in the book, which I kind of, I don't know if I should have followed it, but they, they change what B means. So B is now going to be the number of iterations of this BART algorithm, and K is going to be the number of trees. So I apologize for that. I still don't know if that was the right decision, but I ultimately just slavishly uh, followed along with what they did. Uh, they have jobs at Stanford, so it seemed <laughs> it seemed like it was something I should do. Um, so okay, so again, K is now the number of regression trees. B is the number of iterations, um, and so notice that these are going to be like the the endpoints, and 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 then. You know, so you see lowercase b and lowercase k. So this would be the kth uh, regression tree at the bth iteration. Um, okay. So, um, all right. So this is kind of, not kind of, this is the schematic of what's going to happen. Um, you're going to have k. So think of this as sort of a, a grid where we have or columns, I guess, or the, the, the trees. Um, and then as you go down, you go through the iterations. Notice that each tree is going to start off as just a node. Um, and then, then you go on to your, your first split. And your, your initial split, um, one thing that hopefully you can see, I'm going to zoom in, that they've really, I think, done a nice job indicating here is that they're not going to be identical. So there's going to be randomness in how these trees are created. Um, so here they're saying, you know, was x2 less than or equal to some cut point one? You know, here they're using a different variable. In each case, they're using a different variable, but they could have also said, you know, here x2 is less than or equal to c2 at a different cut point, All right? So but the general idea is that we're going to have randomness in how trees are created, and, the, and they refer to them as uh, perturbations. Um, and, then, and then as trees, as we go down the iterations, um, we'll see this a little bit more, but different things can happen to the trees. Notice that this tree kind of just shrinks back up into its uh, original node, and whereas these two, so if trees one and k, um, both go on and split their left branch. Um, and then it's an ensemble method, so at the end we're going to um, average these trees to get the final predictions. Okay, so we're going to be averaging over k trees as we've been doing this this entire time. Well, I guess we've been averaging over b trees, but we're, now b is k. Um, so I apologize for that. Okay, um, so this is a little bit more on these perturbing predictions. Um, well, okay, on the perturbed tree growth process. So, okay, so let's see. Again, notation, I guess it's good to practice. Um, so remember, um, so this is the same tree. It's the kth tree. But we're going from iteration b minus one to to, to it should this should be b. I apologize. This should be b. Not uh, I should have deleted the that part. Not the I should have deleted the, this part. Not the part I didn't did in fact delete. All right. Anyway, so we're going from a prior tree to a more a newer tree. And what does that look like? Uh, in this case, it's kind of a strange thing. But based on the partial residuals, what this tree did to update was it changed its predictions at the leaf nodes. Right, so you'll see that these the structure of the tree is the same going from the b minus one iteration to the bth iteration, 
Um, so the split points are the same, right? The, the structure is the same, but all of these numbers are just ever so slightly different. And is, so the, is, that, is that just because it's like fitting now to a, a different data set, right? Because it's counting for it's the residuals after the previous trees are, are included, right? That's why this changed? That is at least one reason. One reason. Um, so one thing that I have not looked into is exactly what the nation, the the the, uh, the exact nature of this. What they refer to as like the perturbing the tree. I mean, they they leave it as very impressionistic, almost just like I've sh I'm just like shaking a tree and some kind of random thing is going to happen. They do allude to the fact that the way the perturbations happen uh, corresponds to certain priors. So the B, uh, you know, in, in Bayesian, the, the B in BART is for Bayesian. And so one thing that I'll, I'll get to earlier or later, but just, I'll just mention it. I might as well mention it now, is that at the end um, of this process, when you have your um, K trees at the B iteration, you're gonna get a posterior, like this is a very Bayesian, um, process in which you're going to get a posterior distribution that comes from having certain priors and then a certain likelihood at the end. And that's really all I know about these perturbations is that they, that they, yes, going from the B minus one to B three um, or B iteration of the K three, um, the residuals are going to change, the data is going to change, but also there's going to be some amount of randomness that happens. And that, that randomness to me is still a black box. So correct me if I'm wrong on this. My impression was like at each step, like you roll a dice, decide yeah. what kind of perturbation you're going to do. Yeah. And that has nothing to do with the data or maybe it does. I don't know, but it's like, Oh, today I'm going to grow my tree. Today I'm going to shrink my tree. Today I'm just going to keep it the same and refit it today. I'm going to whatever. And then, and then once you've chosen your perturbation and uh, then you have your, your new updated data based on all the trees in the past that, and the residuals after those, and then you refit it. That, that was my impression, but I could be completely wrong in that. So I just wanted to run it by you. No, I think that that's, that's right. Laura, did you want to say something? Yeah, I just, it's been a while since I read the chapter, to be honest. But so if I understand it correctly, the B minus one iteration kind of serves as it's functionally the prior of the B iteration. Is that kind of the idea? Um, and I'm assuming obviously the B minus one would take into account the B minus two, you know, and so on and so forth. But I'm trying to think ba like a Bayesian, not sure if I'm doing that <laughs> accurately. Yeah, you know, I hadn't thought about, it. I mean, so yes, so that is like an updating process. I hadn't thought about it at that level of granularity. Um, like each, you know, yeah, I mean, that would make sense. I guess that's the way it has to be, you know? I mean, that is the Bayesian updating process is posteriors become priors. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna say yes and just embrace possibly being completely wrong. But um, yeah, all right. Um, so, so, okay, so, so Jonathan alluded to uh, this rolling of the dice to basically um, decide what kind of perturbation you're going to do. Um, so I'll go into that the possible, I guess, the sides of the die, as it were. Um, <clears throat> so, so one result you can get is to have the same tree and update your uh, the predictions. Another one is <laughs> perturbed pruning. Uh, so one thing you can do is say, okay, I'm going to prune my tree. Uh, and so notice here what happens is we have the same initial split, um, but then this entire left branch goes from having three leaf nodes to now just having one prediction for every observation that uh, where X is uh, less than 169.17. So that's one thing that can happen. Or conversely, uh, you have perturbed growth. Uh, so um, notice here that basically uh, we just add one, one split here. So, th so those are the three different things that can happen. You can have uh, pruning, you can have growth, or in the first slide for this section, uh, there was same structure, same splits, just uh, different predictions. So a three-sided die, if that is exactly what, what happens. All right, um, I'm not gonna go into this algorithm. This is by far the most confusing of the, of the algorithms because of, um, it's really mostly because of this part where we have three nested processes going on. 
Um, so we have, you know, for each iteration, for each tree, for each observation, and that's that's at least one too many layers of nesting for me to comfortably present right now. Um, but I encourage you to, to look at the book for this. Um, and everything is basically as we've said, I mean, it's boosting with the randomness uh, and, that's, and that's it. And then at the, at the end, I'll just go down to the, the bottom of this, this bottom of the slide. Um, I mean, this is characteristic ensemble predictor, right? We've got the, the BART predictor, uh, the BART function um, is, oh no, it's not. All right, well, so if you were able to see the subscript of the sum, which I cannot. Um, Are you able to scroll down a little bit more so it's not covered? Uh, yeah, I mean, I can, I can, I can do that. Um, yeah, there we go. Okay. Um, so, so, so notice. <laughs> All right. Hey. Uh, um, so the, the, this L, um, perhaps uh, you might remember, is is the burn-in number. So say that we did uh, a thousand trees, and we don't want to we we don't want to look at the first hundred of them. We would have nine hundred trees. So it'd be this would be a fraction of one over nine hundred, and we'd start at the hundred first again, assuming that we set L to one hundred, and uh, and that would be it. Um, okay, so, so that's the key difference, um, and at least the formula, um, the ensemble formula. Uh, and let's just. So if I picture that that matrix of trees that you had, yeah, we are not just taking the last um, row of that. We're taking like the last b minus l rows. Exactly. Yes. Um, and so that's part of. Uh, well, okay, I'll, I'll get to that in a second. Uh, here's Bart performance. Um, so the main thing to notice from this, uh, I, I suppose, let's see. So what are the key lines? We have BART test error, uh, this blue line. So I guess the main things to, well, no, there are a few important things. First, the gray box, why is that, why is that there? That's the burn-in period. Um, so notice that during that burn-in period, um, BART is you know, chugging away, is, is reducing its uh, error. Um, yeah, that's what it's doing. Go ahead, Laura. It doesn't it look like I'm trying to see. It looks like the BART error doesn't actually change that much. And if I'm reading this, uh, the legend correctly, right? The BART's the golden yeah. and the light blue. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, OK. Which yeah. seems counterintuitive to me. I don't know the answer. I'm just. I think that's the point, though. It stays flat. It doesn't. There's the, the training and tests don't diverge like they do with the boosting. It stays. It doesn't overfit okay but All interestingly right. it almost seems like is the burn-in error is the burn-in period actually needed because it's flat you know right 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 so yeah so yeah so i think laura and i were focusing on this this gray box and now uh, jonathan you've stolen my thunder and you've gone over here to the right <laughs> side of the graph uh where what everyone was supposed to notice was that uh whereas boosting is going to start overfitting um, and you notice here, like it's getting its error down for the, so, okay, dark blue line is boosting training error. It's going to go down to zero. So at this point, remember what it's doing is just fitting residuals, right? So it's getting rid of noise at this point uh, when we start to see that the, um, this green line is starting to go up. Um, okay, so in the effort of, uh, of, of finishing, um, so this is an interesting thing to think about um, that the BART really is uh, a Bayesian method. Um, and so, yeah, so I'll end it there and just say that one, one nice thing about, about BART is that instead of just getting one prediction, um, you get B minus L predictions. So you get a posterior distribution and which those of you who have some exposure to Bayes will know is that you can get, you know, credible intervals from that. You can, uh, just start treating that sample of predictions as, you know, ways to get intervals, uh, in a really simple, at least a conceptually simple way of just treating that as like, oh, you know, I just want, uh, if I want, um, if I want to be traditional and have a 95% credible or confidence interval, you know, I just look at percentiles, quantiles of my uh, posterior distribution. And I just treat it like a sample. I just use R's quantile function, for example. Oof. In any case, that's where I'll leave it because we're out of time.
Cool. That was Thanks. that was great. Yeah, really good. Um, I feel like we should do the lab. I don't want to do the lab, but uh, <laughs> if no one else. Like, I don't want to personally present the lab, but if no one else wants to, um, yeah, I, I could. I could work on the lab. Honestly, I have. I have to go and watch some of these videos just because the ones that um, you know the authors of the book created. I read this chapter. I, I have not done this before in my work. Any of this tree stuff, um, and it's been. A, I probably read this chapter like ten days plus ago. So. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I can throw something together, but I have no, I personally have no idea if it's going to, if I'll be able to <laughs> put a good presentation, but I'm happy to throw something together. I mean, to a large degree, I think, you know, I probably, I want to do the lab. So if we all kind of do the lab and then just talk about it, um, it, you know, you being in charge of it, that's great, but let's all try to do it probably, or as many as can. Um, yeah. Cause this is, you know, this is some I, I have done. I've used XG Boost, but without really that well understanding what I was doing, which is how I think a lot of people use XG Boost because it still works even if you don't really understand what you're doing. Um, so, uh, yeah, I just I think it's worth worth doing this. So I signed up for two weeks, thinking we would do I would do Chapter Nine. Um, you know. Right. Both parts. So I can do, I can present on the 22nd and other people, I can do whatever I can. Other people, obviously, as you were saying, John could present their, whatever they've come up with through the lab. Um, I can also present the first part of chapter nine on the 1st of March. I will probably not be able to attend book club on the 8th. So I kind of hate to use <laughs> to do the half measure thing, you know, I know Justin is always finishing the chapters he started. <laughs> so, I mean, or I can swap with somebody later on. It's really, I don't have a strong preference other than knowing that I cannot present on the 8th or the 15th. Okay. I have a meeting on the 15th. So. Okay. Um, all right. Well, I, I think it's worth doing the lab. So let's do the lab next week. And then, and everyone think about whether you can swap in on the spreadsheet for chapter nine. Um, yeah. And then we'll go from there. But so let's plan. Let's, let's do this lab next week. All right. I will see everyone in a week. Bye. Hey,